I thought I would start by mentioning, asking, what is tomorrow? <laughs> Christmas, that's right. Yeah, it's good. One has to mention it. <laughs> I'm sure it hasn't gone. It hasn't gone unnoticed by everyone. I think it's pretty difficult to ignore. So. But very, uh, very much uh, these days, of course, the message of Christmas is very commercial and the emphasis is on consumerism, on buying things and giving gifts. Giving gifts is very good, of course. There's nothing wrong with that as long as one doesn't feel a pressure to do it. But what is the message of Christmas? Peace, do I hear peace? That's good. Yeah, peace and goodwill, actually. Usually that's what they say to, um, to everyone to the whole of earth. So this is the message, and of course this is the message of, in Buddhism, the message of metta. It's the message of metta. But I'm not going to speak about metta today. <laughs> but just to mention too that Christmas is a time of giving, and that's a very important part of the Buddhist path too, which I'm not going to talk about either, which is called dana. But it is a very important thing for opening the heart, for developing the qualities of the heart, because so much of our habitual tendency is to think of me and mine, what I need, what I like, what I don't like, what I want, what I don't want, and it's all about me. But of course giving goes in the opposite direction. Uh, it's thinking of the other person. And uh, this is something that reduces this sense of ego, this sense of getting and gaining, which is a, one of the defilements, we say, of the mind, one of the things that uh, uh, darkens the mind. And of course, in, very, in a very true, real sense, most of the Buddha's teachings are about giving in one sense or another. So for instance, we have a teaching on dana, this is generosity, giving, as I mentioned. But we also have sila, and sila of course is keeping the five precepts or higher, more precepts, one can keep more than that. And this is a real gift. Who is it a gift to? It's a gift to ourselves first, <laughs> because we don't get into trouble. <laughs> Here and now we don't get into trouble. Because if we break any of those precepts, generally we get into trouble, if not with the law, with people around us, the people we live with, you know, the family we're in, the workplace we're working in. Wherever we are, we will get into strife, we'll be at, uh, in confrontation with other people. But of course, it's also a gift to others, isn't it? Very much so, because if we're not harming other, other beings, they can relax, they don't have to feel threatened, they don't have to worry, they don't have to be anxious, do they? Because they know that we're not there to harm them and that we're not there to take their property or to lie to them. They can trust what we, we say. And this is a very, very important gift. And particularly in the modern world, you know, they say business actually runs on trust. You know, there has to be a sense of trust. And if that's lost, then it gets uh, very difficult. So we have cases, you know, in some countries where there's corruption and that, that actually undermines that trust and makes it very difficult. And of course, other gifts that we give in Buddhism come through meditation or bhavana, sometimes we call it mental cultivation. And this is meditation and this is a gift of loving kindness is a wonderful gift to give. And you know, at Christmas, as I mentioned, you know, there's goodwill and peace to all, all beings is the, the wish of metta. But rather than just saying that, isn't it better to give it? <laughs> give that feeling, arouse that feeling in oneself. Because as, as I often say to people, the gifts are usually not that important, but where we're coming from, how we give a gift is actually usually vital and it's usually the real gift actually. If we just give it very casually without any thought, you know, this is for you, you know, plonk it down, <laughs> down next to What's that message going? To, the message the person going to get? They're going to get the message. Well, you know, it's just going through a, a you know, a, a ritual. We're just going through the, the motions. That's what we say in English, isn't it? Going through the motions. So the real gift of uh, at Christmas time, at any time, we can give to others is loving kindness, not only to others but to ourselves. As I always say, if you're going to give a gift. You have to have it first, don't you? Whatever it be, whether it be money, food. If you want to share food with somebody, you certainly have to have it first. <laughs> it's the same with metta. If we're going to share metta, loving kindness with others, we have to have it. And that means our mind is filled with this quality of uh, friendliness, acceptance, warmth, openness, which is a wonderful quality to have. And to me, you know, often... Um, there used to be this saying, wasn't it? I think very, just dating myself very much. I think it was Marshall McLuhan said, 
the medium is the message. The medium is the message. And this is talking about mass media, actually. And this was in the 70s and the 80s, I think. It was a bit, it was a bit of ahead of his time, really. It's become, become so true, actually, that the medium, the mass media, for instance, is actually a message in itself. But the uh, uh, meta is also the message, isn't it? This love and goodwill, this friendliness to other beings. So it's very, these are the gifts we can give. And there are a lot, lot more gifts because obviously if we develop mindfulness and uh, uh, mindfulness too, we can be with people. We can be with ourselves, that's very important. Uh, but we can also be with others. When we're with them, we're there. You know, and this is a wonderful thing to, to do rather than be looking around or you know, thinking uh, inside, thinking about the past or the future or what we have to do. Many, many things that we can concentrate on. But I wonder if people remember where we were up to in the Noble Eightfold Path. This is what I'm. This is the gift for today. The, the gift today is right speech, right speech. It uh, doesn't sound very exciting. I think sometimes people, when they they, they uh, think of the Noble Eightfold Path, they think, "Ah, oh, samaditi. That's good. Right view. That's really important. And uh, right intention or right motivation. Where we're coming from. How we practice a path. Oh, that's really important. And then they skip. The, the, the skip right speech, right action, right love. They think, well, wow, you know, it's okay. <laughs> it's sort of, you know, yeah. But they go straight to uh, right effort and then to the, the meditation factors, you know, right effort, right mindfulness, and then right stillness or right samadhi, uh, sometimes called right concentration. But actually these three uh, qualities, you know, right speech, right action, and right livelihood are so important you know, in so many, many ways and so vital to our lives. Um, because in a very real sense, the, what causes the problems in our lives usually starts with wrong speech, the things we say to other people. And this can escalate, you know, from just within the family. You know, you can see it within the family. If, if uh, there is a, a wrong speech, and I'll go into the different types of wrong speech in a minute, but if there is, you know, like abusive speech or if there's lying or if there is um, uh, uh, divisive speech, setting one person against another, if that's in the family, you can see what it does. It creates a lot of distrust. It creates a lot of disharmony in the family. And even, you can see it it large in society, you know, you can see it in society when we cannot trust another person's speech or when it's abusive or divisive, uh, then it, it causes a lot of problems that even bring about wars, uh, bring about a lot of the, the negative things that we experience in society these days. So very important that our speech come from the other two factors that I mentioned before. <laughs> Do you remember those? right view and also right motivation. Why is that important? Because if we, th if we reflect that we, what we do and we say and what we think for that matter has a result, it has an effect, it has, creates karma we say, then we tend to be a little bit more careful about how we speak. Then we're aware that there are consequences, you know, karmically. Often we get the consequences immediately anyway, <laughs> but there are consequences further down the track too. They can affect even our rebirth and so on. And also it affects the, the actual um, thing we're striving for, for awakening, for enlightenment, because you know we are, as it were, dedicating ourselves to discovering truth, isn't it? And if we're not practicing truthful speech, we're not practicing right speech, this is going to make it very difficult. <laughs> it means the, the means we're using won't actually bring about the aim that we wish to attain. And of course, the second factor of, of um, right motivation is that's very important. Where we're coming from is very important. And if this is right, how can our speech be wrong? You know, if we have got the, uh, the intention of letting go, of uh, giving up, and uh, not trying to get if we have the intention of loving-kindness, non-ill will, they call it, and non-cruelty, non-harming, if we have that, like compassion and loving-kindness in our minds, then our speech will tend to be of the same quality. Then we have no problems. 
Um, so if we have the two first two factors right, the rest of the path tends to follow uh, suit, as we say, follow suit. So as I mentioned, the four types of uh, wrong speech, I think everybody knows these, is lying, of course, and this is in the five precepts. The other three types of wrong speech are not mentioned in the five precepts, so it's, it's quite interesting. But lying is a very, uh, uh, a very important one because if we're not truthful to others and to ourselves, it's very unlikely we're going to discover truth, actually. As I said, we've got the wrong going about it the wrong way. But also the other types of uh, speech that the, the Buddha recognizes is very destructive. They are very destructive. It's divisive speech. And, you know, uh, this is, this is, we're all familiar with it. When you hear this title, divisive speech, people probably think, my goodness, what is he talking about? <laughs> but it gives a little idea, I think. I hope it does. Sometimes they call it tail-bearing and backbiting and all this sort of thing. But divisive, I think, is quite, quite descriptive. It means when we tell one person something with the intention, either the intention, uh, we consciously the intention to divide that person from the other person. Sometimes people do that. Sometimes unconsciously we do that, or not deliberately, but it can be there as well. You know, we tell other people, we tell somebody what another person said. And of course, when they hear what the other person said, then they're going to, oh, they're going to be angry and upset. I think it's always good when that happens, when you hear something from somebody else about another person, always have it in, in with a big, big question mark. Maybe they've misunderstood what the other person said. Maybe it's their take on it. <laughs> you, you can't tell, you know. So always, when it's a reported speech, uh, it's always good to uh, keep an open mind. Actually, one of the things I like in Sinhala, when they speak the language in Sinhala, they put lu on things. It means like it, it uh, sort of it makes that idea, it's just reported. You know, it's not fact. They're making a distinction between fact and the fact that it's uh, it's just something reported, you know, that you've heard. Because it's always good to bear that in mind. When you're hearing it through a third party, well, <laughs> maybe it's right, maybe it's not right. So good to keep it in mind and not immediately jump to conclusions and, and uh, you know, to a negative reaction to to the person who the, uh, they were hearing this about. And, of course... That uh, the other sort of the third type of uh, wrong speech, I should say here again, as I mentioned before, right and wrong uh, uh, in terms of attaining what we want to attain, where we want to go. Right is in, in terms of right for awakening, right for enlightenment, and wrong, wrong for wrong for uh, enlightenment, wrong for awakening, not possible. That's where right and wrong come in. Because I, I know very very often people, myself included, many years ago, often stumble over this right and wrong. It just seems, uh, seems well, who can say what's right? Who can say what's wrong? You know, like categorically. And quite interesting, interestingly, Bhante Gunaratna, he, doesn't, he avoids that. He calls it skillful. So it's skillful view and skillful um, intentional motivation and skillful speech, which is a nice way of saying it, actually. But it is right in the sense of right for attaining awakening. And it's also right for developing happiness. <laughs> because that, uh, it's something that will lead to harmony and lead to uh, developing peace uh, in ourselves and other people and with other people. So the third type of wrong speech, as I was just mentioning, is harsh speech. Or um, sometimes they, I've heard it uh, called abusive speech. And we get a lot of this in Australia. <laughs> There's a lot of, include swearing, sarcasm, you know, rough words, um, uh, very uh, violent sort of language, uh, verbal abuse, these sorts of things. And I think people are familiar with this. Um, in Australia, sometimes the harsh speech, especially the swearing, people don't even know they're doing it. <laughs> I've, I've heard people swearing away, and I'm sure they don't know they're doing it, actually. So... It's a, that's another type of, of wrong speech. It also means uh, if you don't know you're doing it, there's not much mindfulness, is there? And that's the essence of, of right speech too. If we have mindfulness, then we will tend to speak in, a, in a ways of the opposite of these. And the last one, the most difficult one for people, is gossip and idle chatter. And this is, this is just uh, talk and uh, talk about things that, not that important. It's just, as we say, gossip columns, a lot of the internet, a lot of the news we read, 
is just, you know, just idle, uh, as it were, chatter. Or it's not, um, I suppose, one of the uh, one of the, uh, the ways of looking at it. It's not meaningful. It doesn't have a, a meaning, a purpose uh, in itself. And as I mentioned, these these this is the wrong speech. And the opposites of those are, of course, you know, uh, for lying is truthfulness, for divisive speech is speech that brings people together, brings harmony. Uh, and this is very important. And then for the harsh speech is gentle speech, you know, speech that is uh, kind and gentle, um, soothing. And then for uh, idle, uh, idle chatter or gossip, there's meaningful speech, you know, talking about things that mean something, they're important to us. So these are the, the opposites of it. And so when we are, this is an important thing, when we are in the Buddhist path, of course, with something that's a negative mind state, we try and let go of it. So if it's wrong speech, we try and let go of it. But we also try to develop wholesome uh, or positive mind states. And if we do that, we can develop positive sorts of speech. And that, as it were, counteracts the uh, negative speech that we might be practicing. One of the problems with speech is it's so habitual, isn't it? <laughs> we speak in such a... We've got patterns of speaking, patterns of thinking. And the trouble is it's very, very quick. That's, that's, the, that's the, the trouble. And I know I, I stayed at a meditation center in uh, 2006, 2007 it was, too, over the year, over the uh, new year. And uh, this was at uh, Sayadu Utejanir. He's been here. He's, he's quite a famous monk now. And he teaches at the Shweu Min Center in uh, Yangon, they call it, or Rangoon as it was. And uh, one of the things they, he encourages is uh, to be mindful of speech. So in other words, at this meditation center, he doesn't say, you've not, you know, noble silence, no one's to speak. He says, you've, you've got to practice some speech every day at least. You know, just being mindful while you're speaking. Because for us, that's really difficult. Because the mindfulness usually lags way, way behind. It's after we've said something, it's out. <laughs> oh my God, what did I say? <laughs> and then you think, oh no, no, I shouldn't have said that to this person or whatever. So it's very important, you know, that we do develop that mindfulness and to see speech as an important training for our minds, actually. This is, this is a, a training for our minds as well because if we're mindful, we can, as it were, influence what we say, how we say it, and, uh, and therefore reduce a lot of the impact, negative impact anyway, <laughs> of our speech. So very, very important to... Uh, as it were, uh, to, be, to develop mindfulness with it. Difficult, as I say, because we're so habitually, uh, uh, we have our habitual patterns of speaking. And very importantly, of course, as I mentioned before, once it's out, once we've said something, <laughs> you can make a retraction, but it's not retracted from the other person's memory. And they may, may forgive, but rarely do they forget. You know, they, or it's always in the back of the mind. You know, so it can't erase speech, you know, that one has, uh, has already spoken. So very important. And often we do wish, don't we, that it could, as it were, wind it back and erase <laughs> some of the things we said. Or, uh, so it's very, very important that we have that mindfulness beforehand, you know, so that we can, um, as it were, speak skillfully, speak speech that doesn't cause others harm. It doesn't cause us harm. So, and the Buddha had a very nice, uh, this is a very nice verse uh, that I read from Bhante Gunaratna had it actually from the Sutta Nipata from the Buddha. And uh, it's, it's worth thinking about. And it's quite, I think many people can identify with this too. And the translation is, every person who is born is born with an axe in his or her mouth. A fool who uses abusive or harsh language cuts himself or herself and others with that axe. So it's very that's good, isn't it? Uh, to think of, you know, our speech like an axe. That's really quite a strong, you know, the Buddha was really good at these extreme uh, similes, extreme uh, images that stick in the mind. How many people think they've got an axe in their mouth? I don't think anybody does. <laughs> but in fact they have. It's a real weapon, isn't it? It's a real danger. And... Uh, so this is something to, to keep in mind, the axe in the mouth and uh, what harm it can do us and can do to others. 
Of course, when we harm others, we're harming ourselves in a, really, in a real sense, in a karmic sense, creating bad karma. And there's a, a nice story that I like um, from Nasruddin, which is a bit, it's related to this, actually, related to this about uh, uh, quite a cheeky thing about uh, uh, wrong speech in a way. And uh, Nasruddin is this uh, a Sufi, Sufi teacher, Sufi philosopher, and somewhat of a scallywag too. <laughs> very funny too, his teachings. And I like the stories, his teaching stories, very interesting. And in this uh, story, the, he, was, uh, he had arranged with this philosopher to have a debate. A philosopher was going to come to his home and no doubt demolish Nasruddin with his logic, his reasoning or whatever. And so the debate was organized and the philosopher was going to come to his home, to Nasruddin's home. And he came and Nasruddin wasn't at home. And he was really angry because this was going to be a significant event, this debate. He was, no doubt he thought he was going to win. So he's really angry. So he wrote on the gate, there was, must have been, there was a piece of chalk or something nearby. He wrote on the, the gate, stupid oaf. And then he went off. He was absolutely, you know, enraged that, uh, well, he probably also thought, ah, Nasruddin is scared. He knows he's going to lose. <laughs> so he went home. And then Nasruddin came back to his home and he saw the, the, uh, the comment on the gate, and, uh, and he thought, oh my goodness, I forgot about the, the appointment, the debate we were going to have. So he went to the philosopher's house, and he said, oh, I'm terribly sorry, I, I forgot about the debate, and I I'm, you know, just came to see you and say sorry that I, I was, I, um, I'd forgotten. He said, I remembered as soon as I saw your name on the gate. <laughs> It's quite a good one, isn't it? Very good, very clever he was. I don't know whether that would have done much for his apologies. <laughs> after, after that, the philosopher was, oh. It's probably the opening tactic to, to throw him off balance for the debate. So. And these days, as I mentioned, it brings a lot of harm. And that's a, this is a humorous one, but it does bring a lot of harm. It can also bring a lot of good, the speech we, we have. And so you can, you know, many people also engage in, in beautiful speech. And the Buddha was one that uh, was excellent at that, and was amazing. The sort of speech would be tailor-made for the person. Of course, he had the advantage, didn't he, that we don't have. He could read minds, he knew the dispositions of people, so he could tell you know, where they were coming from, and the speech could be tailored to what that person would need and what would get through to them. So this is something we can't do, but the Buddha could do. And today, in a very uh, real sense, a speech is also included on the, uh, the mass, in the mass media, isn't it? In the, the newspapers and uh, the, on the internet particularly. Social media is, is a very big thing these days, for, for ill or for good. <laughs> And you hear, you hear many, there are many good things about the internet. People often, myself included, go on about the ills of the internet and you know, the decline of civilization and whatever. But there are many good things about it. In fact, I say to people, in no time in history, no other time, not even when the Buddha lived, is the Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha, so available. His, his own, the original teachings and many other people's comments on it. It's just incredible. It really is. But at the same time, we have, you know, all these things like Facebook and Twitter and whatnot, and certain presidents seem to use Twitter all the time <laughs> for, for getting people's, uh, upsetting people, <laughs> and so on. So, and also we hear, don't we, in Facebook particularly, probably Twitter too, you know, kids that uh, get this hate, hate uh, well, mails and messages and so on, and you even hear that people commit suicide because of these sorts of things. They go through a lot of psychological um, damage, we could say, psychological suffering, because of what they read, what they, what, what they, and you can hear it too, of course, on the internet. You can get videos and all that sort of thing. You can send videos with your face. You'd be on Facebook and everything. So, so this is very, uh, very these days actually more important. And the, in a way, the, the trouble with that is it's so instantaneous and you can reach many people. Whereas if you just speak to one person, well, the impact is that person, maybe the people just immediately around. But with the internet, you could, you could theoretically send it to thousands at the same time, or probably millions even if you wanted, if you had that many friends. And the, the important thing about uh, right speech and wrong speech, wrong speech, yeah, whatever speech we have, People tend to react in a similar way. So if we 
you know, have abusive speech, little wonder that people come back in a very aggressive and defensive fashion and it, does, it doesn't lead for a, a very good relationship. So whatever we give out tends to come back to us in, in a very much, in a very direct way. It's a boomerang effect. We live in Australia, so it <laughs> certainly comes back to us. But some of the things that I think are most important for right speech, just the guidelines that the Buddha gave, and really, you know, when we hear these guidelines, I think when I hear them, I think, yes, yes, common sense, you know, this is really sensible. This is, you know, this, yes, this will work. So this is, uh, this is the, the, the message. That, and the Buddha gave a lot of attention to speech because speech is what we, how we interact with uh, each other. It's, it's the big factor that causes division, causes harmony. Uh, it's, it's so, so important. And also, you know, our speech, it reverberates in our minds too, you know, uh, particularly the negative speech. You know, after we've said something negatively, it just keeps going on in the mind. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. You go to sit down and meditation. And go, oh, <laughs> and then when the mind gets peaceful, it becomes even stronger. Those reverberations, those echoes, really get strong, and we feel uncomfortable. But of course, the most important uh, advice the Buddha gave this advice to his son Rahula, Venerable Rahula, when he was seven years old. Very interestingly, the Chinese translations of the of this sutta that, where the Buddha gave his advice. It's from another school of Buddhism, not from the Theravada school of Buddhism. It was from another school of Buddhism. Had some information that was very, very useful, really. The reason, it doesn't tell you in the, uh, in the Theravada uh, sutta the reason why the Buddha gave it, but in, in the Chinese one it said, the reason the Buddha gave it was because his son had told a lie, was telling, was telling a lie, was playing, he's only seven years old, <laughs> He was playing a game and people would come to the monastery and ask if the Buddha was there and he'd tell them, no, he wasn't there, and he was there. <laughs> and so, so these sorts of games, and so the Buddha had heard, so then he gave this teaching to, according to the Chinese, Agama as they're called, uh, gave this teaching on about, it's not only about speech, it's about uh, our actions, our speech, and even our um, mental actions, our thoughts, our thinking, uh, and, and the criteria we should use for judging whether I sh we should do something, say something, or even think something. And the first one, which is no surprise, does it harm myself? You know, we just, we can think, and does this uh, speech that I'm going to say, does it harm me? Or does it harm the other, another person or other people? Does, you know, what I'm going to say, will they get very upset? Will they be hurt? Um, uh, will they misunderstand? And the third criteria, he said, is if to think, does it harm myself, others, or both? You know, to keep that in mind. Any one of those is enough for saying to ourselves, no, I won't say it. And of course, we have to do this before we speak, don't we? But the Buddha, he is so thorough, he said we should do it not only before, during, and after. So this is quite a review process, you know, it's really going into it. This is mindfulness in uh, great, uh, with great attention, great detail. And the next thing the Buddha said, so that's the first criteria, and it's very good for all of us, you know, does it really harm myself or anyone else? Because if it does, what's the point? Sometimes we <laughs> tell jokes, and some of these jokes can be quite uh, harmful, can't they? You know, they can be very funny, there's uh, quite a few funny jokes, but the actual uh, result of it is actually quite negative, you know and it can harm others or hurt others, really. And actually, humour often relies on that, which is a bit of a shame. So that's very important. And uh, the other, the next thing is where we're coming from. You know, is, is my motivation positive or negative? Is it wholesome or unwholesome? And uh, this is, if it's, it's pretty obvious in many ways, if it's coming from a positive, a good intention, for instance, what I'm saying is motivated by a good intention, you know, just uh, kindness or whatever, then no harm. But if we see it's coming from, uh, you know, anger or ill will, we're annoyed with the person, irritated with the person, then we should say, hold on, <laughs> hold on, I won't, I won't say it, you know. And when the point is with this, when we do, uh, when we do restrain from saying things, we're actually developing mental muscles 
of restraint. To be able to say no to things in the mind is really a power. It can develop into a power. Most often we think something and immediately do it. To be able to see something arise in the mind and say, no, I don't have to act on that. But we're aware of it. Sometimes people talk about this being suppression, don't they? But suppression is really where we're not aware that we're actually ignoring it. We're, we're trying to cover it over. With mindfulness, we know that what's arisen in the mind. You know, it's, it's a negative thing. I won't, I won't act on it. And then we can say no, no to that. We can restrain or we can refrain. And this is not a small thing because it, it leads to a lot of happiness if we can <laughs> refrain from negative things and uh, encourage positive things. And so it's a real power. Most people don't think of it in those terms, but it is. So whether something is uh, positive or negative, uh, whether, we're, whether we're coming from a positive state or a negative state, a wholesome state or an unwholesome state, very important. And sometimes when we're speaking, it can be difficult to, <laughs> to tell because we have the third quality, we have that quality of delusion. This is not seeing things clearly, which can make our motivation seem, you know, we might think, oh, I'm doing it for a good motivation and speak it. But in actual fact, we realize on hindsight afterwards, no, <laughs> it was really coming from a bad place, actually, not a good place. So very important. And the, the Buddha is always very practical because the third thing he said, we should see, should look at the consequences, the results of our speech and see whether it's led to pleasant or painful results. And this this is a very good indicator of whether, uh, whether it's uh, right or wrong speech. If it's right speech, it won't lead to, it generally won't lead to painful consequences. If it's wrong speech, it will generally create problems for us, difficulties to us, and cause a pain for ourselves. Of course, sometimes we can, you know, speak words that are true, but they can be pain, have painful results. And I talk about that later. The Buddha always said, when we speak uh, things that are true, that are correct, and they're, they're beneficial, he said he would speak them whether the person wanted to hear it or not, but he'd speak at the right time. So one has to choose. And of course, for the Buddha, that's easy. He'd know what the right time is. Most of us, we think the right time is now. <laughs> then we blurt it out. And of course, that's usually the wrong time if we feel this, you know, uh, we feel very pushed to say it. It's probably good just to say, hang on, hang on, I'll wait for another time. Because if it is, if it is uh, true and it is correct and it would be beneficial to the other person, then it's worth saying. But as I say, choose, we have to choose the right time, not just blurt, blurt it out. So timing is all important, not only for comedy, <laughs> but for our lives. So, and another uh, set of criteria the Buddha gave, I, I like too, is very, this is, uh, um, Often it's used in terms of uh, when we use it in the, uh, for the monks and the nuns, when we uh, are telling another monk or another nun of something they've done or said that they shouldn't have done or said. Maybe it was breaking one of the rules and they may not have been aware of it. But of course, you know, when you live in a community, the same as when you live in a family, you've got to be very careful. People are very touchy. <laughs> so you have to do it in a very, in a, in a very good way, you know, and especially live day in, day out with a community of monks or a community of nuns. And so, again, the Buddha said, the first thing we should think of is, is this the right time <laughs> to say this, you know? And generally speaking, the right time is when the other person's not occupied um, you know, they're not doing something else, they're not busy, um, they're not, uh, there's not a negative mind state, they're not upset about something, or, you know. So the right time, we've got to choose the right time. When they can hear, and they've got the time, and they can hear it, you know, we don't uh, blurt it out as they're just sort of going to, rushing to catch the tram or something like that. That's not a very good time to do it. And also, when we, when we are talking to somebody like this, when we're, we're mentioning something, and this is very useful for us because there's always going to be times when we have to mention to other people things that are not right. And um, so we also, it's also should check up on the facts, make sure we have the facts correct. We know that what we're speaking is factual and we can put it in a way that, that the other person understands. This is what I understand, either from my own experience. It's good to let them know if you've heard this because it could be incorrect 
or we've, you know, somebody else has heard it or somebody else has seen it, could be incorrect. And then the third thing is that it's beneficial for the person who is hearing it. And that's very important. We want their well-being. What is beneficial? In the Buddhist sense, it's, it's anything that leads to happiness, well-being, but also leads towards the goal, we'd say. You know, and the goal is towards enlightenment, awakening. So it goes in that direction. Um, and it will be, as I say, a benefit to the person. And the Buddha said the fourth thing we should do is we should speak gently and softly. This is very important if you're telling someone off. <laughs> if you're agitated and fearful, it, 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 they pick up on it, you know, pick up on it. So you're just, or angry, irritated, that would be terrible, you know. They'll just, just pick up on the, the body language and everything and just come back with the very defensive. And, um, and the last thing the Buddha said, we should come from loving kindness. So these are the five things, we should come from loving kindness. When we're telling somebody something or they don't want to hear basically properly, but it's good for them, good to hear, or we need to tell them. So those five factors, very important, the right time, we've got the facts right, and it's beneficial for the other person. We speak with gentle or kindly speech and we have loving kindness. So that way, in the, the Buddha's teaching, and for monks and nuns particularly, the Buddha said, you know, when, when somebody uh, corrects us, when someone shows some sort of mistake to us, it said, he says in the Dhammapada, this is really amazing, in the Dhammapada, that person is like a, um, like a treasure <laughs> because they're, they're, they're pointing out a treasure, someone that, that alerts us to some shortcomings that we have. If we're open, and this is very much the, uh, the important quality, isn't it? If we are open. Usually people, and myself included, you know, we get very defensive. We come from this uh, sense of ego, being offended, upset, you know. How dare they say that to me or whatever it is <laughs> that we think. Whereas if we're interested in spiritual growth, we listen to what people say and think, oh, is there anything in that? Is there anything in that, you know? And uh, I know Ajahn Brahm uses that nice uh, uh, that image, you know, if someone calls you a dog, just check if you've got a tail. <laughs> and it's true. You, somebody says something to you, you think, well, well, maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. Just check it out, see if it's got any value for yourself. You know, it may be completely wrong because oftentimes people get the wrong end of the stick, we say, and they may, they may have done it again, you know, and they may not know you very well where you're coming from. And one of the... The other piece of advice is I like, uh, it from, comes from uh, Bhante Gunaratana, I think everybody can relate to this one. And he, he I think uh, he comes from his own personal experience, I think. He says that when we, especially when we encounter things we don't want to hear, when people are abusive or um, angry with us or uh, there's divisive speech or whatever, he says that we should simply refuse to let our anger tell us what to say. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> we should simply refuse to let anger tell us what to say. Now that's wonderful. I think that's great. That's really good advice. Because usually we're so identified with anger, isn't it? We think it's my anger. It's right. <laughs> and then we're out with it. We say whatever. But to actually think, it takes a bit of mindfulness, doesn't it, to realize that this anger is not me. It's not mine, not myself. It's arisen due to causes and conditions. I've conditioned it to arise in the, from my previous ways of reacting to things. And I don't have to come from it. Because we have this mindfulness, because we have this ability to refrain or restrain, what I was mentioning before, we can actually say no to these things. It's a, pretty, it's a big ask when the anger is pretty strong, but we can, we can use it. We can get some, as it were, what I like about it, it gives the sense of choice to us. And if you know, we all know where you, when you have anger in the mind, the irritation, annoyance in the mind, there's very little choice. You're compelled. You're immediately, we're immediately, you know, saying it, blurting it out. So this is very, very helpful. I like that, uh, the Bhante Ji's advice. I don't know if people know Bhante Gunaratana. He's uh, Bhante Ji. He's very famous for, um, what's it called? Uh, mindfulness in Plain English is probably his most famous book, but they've all got mindfulness in them, <laughs> the titles, his book. He's even got, as I say, one on the Noble Eightfold Path, which is really excellent. 
eight no uh, eight mindful steps to happiness yeah eight mindful steps to happiness and and he uses skillful in that instead of right which is quite interesting his next advice after you've said no to anger is to take some deep breaths do some uh, breathing pay attention to the breathing in and out to calm down and uh, I think, uh, according to Bhante Ji, he's been uh, in some situations where he's needed this <laughs> because things have, you know, he's been in uh, difficult situations with meetings and so on. And he relates one in the book where it was very hard. There was, according to him, a character assassination. And he just had to be, listen to it and not respond. Actually, if you respond often, it's the worst thing, but you, it's very hard not to. And uh, he said in this, in this uh, situation, this person really abused him and ran him down. And it's pretty hard to imagine, but because such a lovely monk. And um, he didn't say anything. And then when it came time to respond, he just did the Namo Tassa and gave the five precepts and finished the meeting. And so this is a, a sort of a, a very a skillful way of dealing with it for himself. I don't know how the other people... Uh, took it, but what it what what it sends a message to the other people to, and to Bhante G too is that we've got to come from Dhamma. We've got to come from trying to grow spiritual qualities. We're not everybody can grow the negative qualities, can't we? We can really cultivate anger into extreme anger, rage. That's pretty many people are doing that. Um, but we're here to develop positive qualities, develop the Dhamma. We develop wisdom that liberates us, doesn't bind us with more defilements, more difficulties in life. So this is um, this is a very nice story of Bhante Ji. So just to uh, briefly, I think, just to uh, talk about the the um, different types of uh, wrong speech and developing the opposite. Of course, the false speech or uh, lying, usawada, is we are developed with the opposite. Is to develop truthful speech and to try wherever we can to speak the truth. And this is very important for ourselves and others. Because truth is a commitment to, not to honesty, but also to uh, less delusion in the world, less delusion in our minds. Because if we lie to other people, we lie to ourselves, we're, just, we're creating more confusion. We're creating more uh, a lack of clarity in our minds. We're not going towards truth. We're not going to find truth if we, um, if we, uh, if we lie to ourselves or to others. And, uh, and of course, this is, this is very important for developing the path to enlightenment. I like this, this is a rather nice one, that it's the commitment, when we tell the truth, it's commitment to wisdom rather than, this is a nice phrase, fantasies woven by desire. Fantasies woven by, good, isn't it? It's good. Because that's often why, where lying comes from. You know, it's from these sort of strange desires either to get or to get rid of, but to like or not like. It's very important. And uh, the, the Buddha had some, as I mentioned before, his criteria for uh, whether, uh, for truthful speech, uh, whether he would, sp when he would speak it was, and he would say something, if something were untrue, he would never speak it. If it was incorrect, he'd never speak it. If it was unbeneficial, he would never speak it. But if it were true, correct, but still un unbeneficial, he wouldn't say it either. And, as, and if something were true, correct, and beneficial, he would find the right time. And whether the, what he was saying would be received badly, well, disagreeable speech, not, not welcome, unwelcome speech, they sometimes say, or whether it's the sort of speech the other person would like and welcome. He would choose the time because he knew it would be for their benefit, for their growth. And this is something we... C it's a bit difficult for us, isn't it, I mean, to judge those things. We can see what's true. Uh, we can get an idea of that and whether it's correct um, and a rough idea of whether it's beneficial. And we also have to think when we do that too, we have to think of ourselves, you know, if it's really going to benefit us too, you know. So that's one thing that, uh, that's another set of criteria that the Buddha had. And refraining from, and of course, any speech that goes towards truthfulness is uh, to be encouraged. Sometimes, though, isn't it? We, as, we, as we're mentioning here, sometimes the truth hurts. And what to do then is very difficult. You know, <laughs> we, we usually get around to 
white lies. <laughs> That's what people do, isn't it? White lies. But there are other options, you know, one of them I've read of and uh, you sometimes see is to remain silent. That's incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult. The Buddha used it quite a lot, quite a lot. But you have to come to a very peaceful place and uh, for most of us that's not very difficult, not, not very possible. But what we can do is look, just say, I'd, I'd rather not say at this time actually, I'd rather not say. Because you have to say something, otherwise people get offended usually. So it is an option to remain silent, but you have to, and that's a fairly difficult one. Sometimes people take that even worse. <laughs> so, and refraining from divisive or malicious speech, is, uh this is, of course, you know, uh, it's been likened to verbal daggers, you know, stabbing other people in the back, as it were, because they're not there. We're talking about them to other people. And this is, of course, very destructive, not only in uh, family, in uh, at work. Anyone that's been in a work environment, I'm sure you've all experienced this, where, where, where things are being said about one uh, behind your back that uh, put the other person against one. So these sorts of things can lead to sort of a sense of paranoia, disease, at work and in the home, wherever it's encountered. And the uh, the Buddha, there's a lovely sutta, I, I like it actually, it's a very extraordinary, extraordinary sutta from the Buddha, an extraordinary simile that goes with it too. And he talks about the speech of a sage and the speech of the fool in terms of oneself, the terms of the person and others. And I, I'll just uh, mention, these one I, I really like actually, he says that uh, a fool, when they're talking about themselves, when they're not asked, they will talk at great length about their good qualities. And when they're asked about uh, their bad qualities, he said a foolish person will, will talk uh, very briefly, at very sketchy detail, and, and try and change the subject as soon as possible. But, he said, he said, the opposite is true when a foolish person talks about other people. And, he said, and they'll talk about unasked, I mean, uh, unasked, they will, they will talk about the bad qualities of other people in great detail, <laughs> in great detail, and elaborate. And when asked about the good qualities of people, I just talk about it briefly, you know, skip over it. And then the difference, the sage, the person, the really wise person, uh, will, when they're asked uh, about themselves, when they're, uh, when they're asked about their good qualities, they'll speak very briefly and very sketchily, won't go into great detail. But, the Buddha said, when a sage is not asked about their bad qualities, they will unask, but they'll just speak about their bad qualities at great length and in detail. So they'll, they'll be very open, very open. And when it comes to talking about others, a sage, when not asked about other people, he will talk about their good qualities at great length. But when he's asked, or she's asked, about the bad qualities of these people, a sage will just talk about it very briefly, just and in, in not much detail. So this this is quite a... I like this because, as you've probably guessed, and as, as I know myself, we're a mixture of the sage and the fool. <laughs> Sometimes we're doing these things, I know. I see it with myself and I think, oh. And it's very... It's, so it's very useful to hear that, actually, to hear that, and to realise these qualities are not other people, it's us too, we're doing it. We've got this mixture of the, the foolishness and the sage. We've got the wisdom and the defilements there. And that's natural. And we're working towards purifying the, the negative and becoming more of the sage. This, uh, this uh, teaching the Buddha gave is amazing because in the end of the sutta, this uh, teaching discourse by the Buddha, he has this remarkable uh, simile, at, uh, simile at the end. He's addressing a whole group of monks and he says, monks, just as uh, a young bride, when she comes to the home for the first time, you know, she will be very respectful to the parents, to, of course, to the new husband, even to the servants, to all the people in the house. But after some time, he said, it all changes. She's, she says to the parents, what do you know? <laughs> to the husband and to the servants, even worse. And he said, he continues, and he says, just in the same way, when monks come first to the monastery, you know, they're very respectful and, and uh, they follow the teachings. And then after some time, they say to the teacher, what would you know? <laughs> Presumably the Buddha. <laughs> 
you know, and uh, so he said, monks develop the mind of a young bride coming to the home for the first time. Isn't that amazing? I think, you know, if you get the context, this is in front of a, an audience of monks and he's saying develop the, the mind of a young bride. It's really, so the Buddha was amazing with these uh, similes that stick in the mind and certainly I think that one sticks in the mind very, very much so. So anyway, I just mentioned, just to finish off, harsh speech we all are all, all, uh, quite familiar with and it's very important to, harsh or abusive speech, very important to recognise this and to avoid it at all costs. People know that they don't like to be abused and of course uh, verbal abuse can, can lead to psychological problems, emotional problems. And I even remember a friend of mine told me his mother was particularly good at uh, verbal abuse and emotional abuse and he, he said to me he would have much preferred her to hit him, <laughs> to, to say the things she said. <laughs> He said it would have been more honest, more easy to deal with than some of the things she said. I thought, wow. So we keep that in mind. But if you keep in mind that we don't want to harm others, then that will hopefully pull us up from abusing another person verbally. And especially when they're young, you know, this, this has an impact down the road. It carries, they carry it with them for a long, long time. And the last one, the, the last type of wrong speech, refraining from gossip and idle chatter, and developing meaningful speech is very important. And so the Buddha actually mentioned to us again that when one speaks, we should speak at the right time, we should speak the facts, we should speak something that's useful and beneficial to the other person and, and to ourselves, and we should talk about something that's meaningful like the Dhamma and the discipline. And he said it should be accompanied by, this is lovely, reason, moderate and full of sense. So that's wonderful, that's a, a very good way. And I'd just like to finish with a last story from uh, Nasruddin, because it's always, they're, they're always fun, <laughs> they're always funny story. I like them. The point of these stories is not only the humour, but the, if you, if you uh, reflect on these stories, you make them your own actually, and they have meaning for you, a particular meaning. So this is the point of those stories, but they have humour too, which is great because we all, we generally take ourselves too seriously. <laughs> it's very important the spiritual path to have a sense of humour. It's very, it's vital actually. So one day Nasrudin went to the market and he saw in the market they were selling these birds for an enormous amount of money. And he thought, these are only small birds and I've got, I've got a bird at home that's much bigger than this. It's surely it'd be worth a lot more. So the next day he came with his bird. It was a hen. <laughs> <laughs> And he, he, he put it, he had it at the market and he was trying to sell it and people were only offering him a tenth of what they were going to, they were paid for these small birds the day before. And he got irate, he got upset and he started abusing people. He said, yesterday you were paying 500 reals, they say in the story, I don't know what this currency is, for these birds and, and they were only small and I've got this big bird and you won't even pay 50 for this bird. And somebody said to him, Yes, Nazarudin, but the parrot, yesterday the birds were parrots and they were talking parrots. And he said, and Nazarudin, he was not to be outdone, he said, ah, he said, but my hen, my hen, she has such deep thoughts, she has wonderful thoughts and she doesn't annoy people with chatter. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think he got his 500 reels actually. <laughs> but it's true. So... So I think it's enough. Uh, that's a very good time with the chatter, idle chatter. So I hope we practice uh, right speech and just to be mindful of the speech and to be really aware of the consequences that has for us and for others is really good. And not to think of it as something separate from the meditation practice, it isn't. Because we need a lot of mindfulness, we need to develop right effort to you know, abandon unwholesome mind states that could be causing the speech develop wholesome ones and also we need as I mentioned mindfulness and to a degree samadhi too it's got to be there to be in the present moment to do, to say the say something that's appropriate at that time so I wish you well for that and this is part of the Noble Eightfold Path the very practical part if the Buddha hadn't thought it was important he could have skipped it out <laughs> but it is very important for our training so thank you for listening and uh, I wish you well in your success being mindful of speech <laughs> <laughs>